At this point, I've showed you how you can use the Turing Pi as a Kubernetes cluster to run different things. I barely scratched the surface of what's possible with Kubernetes, but I'm planning on doing another series exploring Kubernetes itself later this year. So make sure you subscribe to this YouTube channel so you don't miss out. In this episode, I'm going to talk about the Turing Pi's performance. I'm going to compare it to a more traditional Raspberry Pi cluster, my Pi Dramble, and talk about important considerations for your own cluster, like what kind of storage you should use, or whether you should run a 32-bit OS or a 64-bit Pi OS. As with all the other work I've done on this cluster, I've been documenting everything in my open source Turing Pi cluster project on GitHub. You can get a link to that project in the description below. The first thing I want to talk about is benchmarks. But before I get into benchmarks on the Turing Pi, it's important to introduce the topic of benchmarking and explain why I choose certain benchmarks and how I run those benchmarks. There are plenty of sites out there that run every benchmark under the sun on computers. And while that's great for some cases, raw benchmarks out of context aren't always helpful. If you don't focus on something that's important, benchmarking will drive you mad and you'll just start benchmarking anything and everything. Alex Ellis, cron job, stateful set, istio, disk IO, rancher, role-based access control. When I benchmark a cluster like the Turing Pi, I test on two layers. First, the system level to see raw performance potential. I can test the maximum theoretical performance of all the major subsystems, disk, network, and CPU. Second, I test on the application level so I can see how raw performance translates into real world use. Both types of benchmarks are helpful to understand the full performance of a cluster. And no matter what kind of system I'm building, I wanna have a baseline so I can understand how it performs. And I can quickly see if it will meet my needs or it won't. So I have a few things I want to benchmark. How can I make sure my benchmarks are actually useful? Well, the most important thing with any scientific endeavor is to make sure that the benchmarks I run are reproducible. If I run it now, and if I run it tomorrow, and if I run it a thousand more times, will it be within a close range every time I run the benchmark? If not, there are two possibilities. One, it could be a really bad benchmark and I should try something different. Or two, it could actually be exposing a flaw in the system like poor temperature control or a flaky processor. Typically it's the former, but whenever I see a result that surprises me, I spend a lot of time trying to make sure that it's not a mistake I made in my benchmark. And to make sure that the numbers I present are accurate, I run every benchmark at least three times. And I usually run the benchmark once to warm up the system. Then I run it three times, giving a brief cooldown period between each run. Every benchmark that I've done in this video is documented in excruciating detail in my Pi cluster repository. So if you want to try the benchmarks on your own cluster, it's very easy to do. If anyone presents benchmarks without a way to exactly reproduce the testing environment and run the benchmark, then you probably shouldn't trust it. A lot of tech companies do this by posting graphs without scales or references to the benchmarks they used. Don't trust those. Always research on your own if you want to know the true performance of a system. You might be wondering why I've spent so much time talking about how I benchmark, and that's because I try to make my results bulletproof. If you find a flaw in any of these benchmarks, please mention it in the comments or open an issue on the Turing Pi cluster repository. I'd love to make them even better. One of the most interesting things I discovered benchmarking the Turing Pi cluster is the performance of different disk options. Over the past few years, I've done extensive testing on hundreds of different micro SD cards because they're the easiest way to boot up most Raspberry Pis. Some people boot their Raspberry Pis using an external USB hard drive, and that offers better performance and potentially better endurance over long periods of time but it also adds to the footprint of a Raspberry Pi and makes for a little bit of a cabling nightmare. The Raspberry Pi Compute module, which is used in the Turing Pi, has the most flexibility of all the Pi models in choosing what kind of persistent storage you want to use. You have the options of onboard eMMC, which is fast to random access and more durable than microSD, but it's a little slower for large file reads and writes. You also have micro SD cards, which are slow for random access, not as durable, but they're cheap and they're often fast enough for general use. 
Finally, you can use external USB storage, which is hampered a bit on the older Compute Module 3 Plus in comparison to the latest Pi 4, but still offers comparable performance to eMMC with much faster large file reads and writes. But how much of a difference are we talking about? Well, this first graph shows all three options used with a Compute Module 3 Plus. In all the tests, using the microSD card is the slowest option. The HDPARM test at the top checks how fast large files can be written to the disk with a buffer. If you use the Pi as a NAS or media server, this is a good benchmark to see how quickly files can be transferred to and from your Pi's storage. The DD test checks how fast large files can be written without buffering. Paired up with the HDPARM test, you can get a good idea of relative performance for sequential disk access, which is useful when you're copying bigger files. But the 4K tests are actually a better indicator of how well the storage performs general tasks. On a Raspberry Pi, opening a browser, checking email, running a web server, and all those sorts of things require fast random access performance. The faster, the better. So judging by these graphs, it's a good idea to buy the Compute Module 3 Plus with onboard eMMC storage because it's anywhere between 25 to 50% faster than using a microSD card. An external SSD almost doubles the performance, especially when you're copying large files. But like I said earlier, it adds a bit of a cabling mess and can be expensive if you want to buy SSDs for each Raspberry Pi. The nice thing about the Turing Pi is you can choose whichever option you'd like. Each compute module gets its own microSD card slot, so whether you buy the compute module with the MMC or go the cheaper route and get the light version, you can use it in the Turing Pi. For USB, only four of the compute modules get dedicated USB ports, but you can still configure the cluster so there's faster persistent USB storage available to your apps. To get an idea of where the current compute module generation suffers compared to the latest and greatest Raspberry Pi 4, I also ran these tests on one of my Pi 4s. For large files, you can see the blazing speed difference you get from the Pi 4's USB 3.0 ports, which are many times faster than the USB 2.0 ports you get on a Compute Module 3 Plus. The difference is slightly less pronounced for random access, but the Pi 4 still outshines the Compute Module 3 Plus there, especially for random write performance on USB. Note that there is no eMMC option for the Pi 4, so you basically have to choose between much slower microSD card storage or much faster external SSD. There's no middle ground like there is with the Compute Module. So while the Pi 4 wins by a mile for raw performance potential, the Compute Module wins for convenience and flexibility, and hopefully the next Compute Module version will catch up to its larger and newer sibling. In the end, there are two main things that cripple older Pi models, like the 3 Plus, compared to the Pi 4. First, USB 3.0 has 10 times the bandwidth that USB 2.0 had. Second, the Pi 4 supports UASP, or the USB Attached SCSI protocol. This makes transfers even faster. I ran tests on the Pi 4 with US UASP on and off, and it, only, it not only made file transfers 20 to 30% faster, it even shaved off about 10% of the power consumption, since it's lighter on the Pi's CPU. I won't dive into netboot performance in this video because I'm still testing it out, but I'll probably cover it in a separate video, so subscribe to the channel so you don't miss it. Regarding USB boot, it's not too hard to get the compute module to boot over USB, and for the Pi 4, booting via USB is currently in beta, but by the time you're watching this video, it's probably also supported natively. There's a card up above that links to a video where I talk more about booting a Pi 4 with a USB drive. One interesting thing I discovered was the Pi Foundation's documentation states that the Compute Module 3 Plus doesn't explicitly need USB boot mode enabled, but when I was testing it, I did have to enable it, like with the other Pi models. Also, if your compute module has a flashed OS on the eMMC and you want to boot off a USB drive, you have to move or delete the bootcode.bin file off the eMMC's boot volume, so the compute module searches for a USB boot volume. There are some other quirks with USB booting on the compute module, but I won't get too much into the weeds here. I will say that for best performance, you should consider at least booting the master Pi from a USB SSD, no matter what kind of Pi-based cluster you're building. And if possible, set up Kubernetes persistent volumes to use an SSD for the storage backend, even if it's as simple as configuring NFS on an SSD on the master Pi. Moving on from disk I.O. to network I.O., we see a similar story play out for the Compute Module 3 Plus versus the Pi 4. The 3 Plus shares one bus for both USB and networking, so if you do a file copy over the network, it actually makes the theoretical maximum speed slower. 
This graph shows three things, the raw throughput you can get through a single Compute Module 3 Plus, through all seven compute modules on the Turing Pi at once, and then through a single Raspberry Pi 4 with its dedicated gigabit Ethernet port. Even combined and in the best case scenario, the seven Turing Pis transferring data at full tilt can't match a single Pi with its gigabit interface. Also note that unless you have a fast 10 gig network, which most people don't, you'll be limited in your cluster to a maximum throughput of one gigabit for all the Pis on the network. And in either case, you'd likely be limited by internet bandwidth if what you're doing requires any data transfer over the internet. I hope the Compute Module 4 will have the same kind of networking performance I see in the Pi 4. And depending on how the next version is built, it could also result in a less expensive version of the Turing Pi if the board itself doesn't have to build in seven separate network interfaces like it does currently. All right, so the Compute Module 3 Plus has some pretty big limitations against the newest Pi 4, when it comes to disk and network performance. But how does it compare in terms of the processor? The Compute Module 3 Plus has a CPU that's capped at 1.2 GHz due to power supply limitations, so it's even a tiny bit slower than the regular Pi 3 Plus, which runs at 1.4 GHz. And it will certainly run slower than the Pi 4, which has a newer architecture and runs at 1.5 GHz. To get a sense of the raw CPU performance, I ran some tests using Pharonix which is an open source automated benchmarking tool used for many different systems. I ran three tests, a video encoding test, an MP3 encoding test, and a PHP performance benchmark. Since the Raspberry Pi 64-bit beta was also introduced recently, I ran these tests on both the 32-bit and 64-bit versions of Pi OS to see whether the 64-bit version would make any difference with system performance. This test illustrates how much of an improvement a new chip architecture can make, like the one in the Pi 4. It has optimizations for things like video encoding that make a bigger difference than the chip speed alone would indicate. Going from 1.2 to 1.5 GHz is a 22% difference in clock cycles, but the new chip architecture in the Pi 4 means real-world performance, at least when you're encoding video, is a whopping 80% faster. It was also interesting to see that running the 64-bit OS made this test run about 7% faster still. We'll see if that holds up in the other tests. This MP3 encoding benchmark shows the race is a little closer, but the Pi 4 still shows a sizable performance increase. This graph shows that the Pi 4 takes about half the amount of time to encode an MP3 as the Compute Module 3 Plus. In this test, the difference between running a 32-bit and 64-bit OS is very pronounced though, with a 30% performance increase when running in 64-bit mode. The final CPU test I did was this PHP bench run. It tests the raw potential of a PHP application doing CPU tests, but it's not really representative of what a real-world PHP application like WordPress or Drupal would do. But it also shows that the Pi 4 is more than twice as fast as the Compute Module 3 Plus. And again, if you want the best performance for CPU intense tests, it looks like you should run the 64-bit version of Pi OS. One other thing I wanted to mention. Earlier, I talked about the importance of rigorous benchmarking techniques. And another thing that I like to test is the thermal performance of different setups. One problem you might run into when you're testing with Raspberry Pis is thermal throttling. In Grafana, in the previous episode, we created a graph to track the CPU temperature of all the Pis so we could confirm that they weren't throttling. You can also use an IR camera like the Seek thermal camera I have here to measure the temperature across all the different parts of the Pi. In this thermal video, I'm showing how the Turing Pi cluster looks as it boots up. And then how it looks when I run a benchmark on one of the Pis. These videos are sped up a bit, but you can see that nothing on the board gets above 50 to 60 degrees Celsius. The Turing Pi cluster and the Compute Module 3 Plus both seem to do well, even under load, and even when I put them inside my mini ITX case for really long periods of time. I never encountered any thermal throttling, even after running multi-hour CPU benchmarks on multiple Compute Modules at the same time, even without a fan. The same can't be said for the Pi 4, though. When I use it inside a case, I have to use a fan or a special heatsink, like this Flerk case, otherwise the Pi 4 starts throttling the CPU and making the benchmarks run much, much slower. One more note about measuring thermals with an infrared camera like the one I have here. Reflective surfaces like the metal cover on the Pi's SOC, or system on a chip, are kind of invisible to thermal cameras because they don't have high thermal emissivity. When I measure temperatures, I make sure to put a piece of electrical tape or high temperature Kapton tape over the SOC like I did in this clip 
so the actual surface temperature can be picked up by the thermal camera. Otherwise, the processor itself just looks dark or it reflects some other surface and you get a false reading. Now, putting everything together, I, I also measured some application level benchmarks for programs that were running on the cluster. Note that some applications may be more or less impacted by individual node performance in a Kubernetes cluster, as some applications actually scale better than others do when you're running across multiple servers. This graph seems consistent with the CPU benchmarks, but there are two important differences. The graph shows how long it takes to do certain things in Drupal, like installing it and loading a page with the default installation. But with real-world applications, the Compute Module 3 Plus is only about 40% slower than the Pi 4. It's still not the speed champ, but this graph highlights the fact that real-world applications paint a more complex picture when it comes to benchmarking. You can't take one benchmark, like a video encoder or something like Geekbench, and apply it universally to everything you run. Also, contrary to what we saw in previous benchmarks, the 64-bit OS actually performs slower than the 32-bit OS. How can that be? Well, even if you have more RAM available, there are some operations which tend to run more efficiently, even if only slightly, when you have 32-bit memory addresses. And it seems that Drupal's not quite tuned for highest performance memory managing with a 64-bit operating system. But the performance difference is more pronounced on a computer like the Compute Module 3 Plus because the Compute Module 3 Plus only has one gig of memory. On larger Pis like the 8 gig Pi 4, the greater availability of RAM makes memory-based performance differences a lot less noticeable. And that performance difference translates also to page load performance, which is more purely CPU and memory bound than Drupal installation or the first page load. In this graph, you can see the Pi 4 is slightly more than twice as fast. And in an interesting twist, the compute module shows a lot less performance under the 64-bit OS, but mostly that's down to process tuning. With PHP running under Apache, the default configuration I used creates more threads than are optimal for a small server with one gig of RAM, so there's slightly more RAM to disk swapping that goes on when you're running under 64 bits. If properly tuned, the numbers would probably be a little bit closer, as they are in the Pi 4 test, which only has a 5% difference between 32 bits and 64 bits. Up to now, I've only been comparing things on the Turing Pi cluster and on my Pi Dramble cluster, but you might be wondering, how do both of these clusters stack up against the same sort of cluster running in AWS in the cloud, or against a fast modern laptop? Well, I did some more tests and compared Drupal running on a single Pi 4 versus an AWS T3 small instance versus my own Intel i9 laptop, and here are those results. You can see the Pi itself, even the most high-end model you can buy today, has a bit of a ways to go before it will be as fast as a common cloud computing instance and I put in my own laptop just as a reference. You'd need to run at least four of the fastest Raspberry Pi 4 models in a cluster that likely costs 500 bucks or more in total, and you'd still not hit the same performance as a modern Core i7 or i9 laptop with a fast SSD and 16 gigs of RAM. So while the Pi is an excellent platform for testing, discovery, and learning, and a machine like the Turing Pi can even be used to run production applications, if you're looking for the most performance you can get for a good price, the Raspberry Pi is probably not the best option. Does that mean you shouldn't build a Pi cluster? Not at all. Also, does the fact that the Pi 4 is much faster in many ways make the Compute Module 3 Plus and the current Turing Pi a bad choice? Not necessarily. I'm going to cover some of the unique features of the Turing Pi that make it a useful tool regardless of the performance in the next video. And I'll also discuss what's next for the Compute Module, the Turing Pi, and why you still might want to build a Pi cluster. If you aren't subscribed, make sure to hit subscribe so you don't miss any of these videos. And if you want me to keep making videos like this, please go sponsor me right now on GitHub or Patreon. There are links for those in the description below. Until next time, I'm Jeff Geerling.